let's get started for the second session. So welcome back everyone after the break um, to the second session of the IIT School and the session is on change detection and is being led and taught by Dr. Caleb Robinson from uh, Microsoft AI and we are delighted to have him with us and we thank him for his time and for joining us. Um, doc, uh, Dr. Robinson is a data scientist at, in the Microsoft AI for Good Research Lab. His work focuses on tackling large scale problems at the intersection of remote sensing and machine learning computer vision. Some of the projects he works on include estimating land cover from high resolution satellite imagery, detecting concentrated animal feeding operations from aerial imagery and estimating human population density. He's interested in research topics that facilitate using remote sensing imagery for uh, problems in computational sustainability. And some examples would be self-supervised methods for training deep learning models with large amount of unlabeled uh, satellite imagery, human in the loop methods, and domain adaptation methods for generalization over space and time. Um, in this session, we will be learning about change detection using Torch Geo, and that'll be led by Dr. Robinson. Um, and Torch Geo is a PyTorch domain library that provides us with data sets, samples, transforms, and pre-trained pre models for geospatial data. And we will learn how to use Torch Geo with PyTorch to train change detection from, uh, to uh, train, train change detection models from satellite imagery, which is such a relevant and useful topic. So with that uh, being said, I will hand it over to Dr. Robinson for the next four hours to lead the session. Awesome, uh, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Excellent. Let me bring my slides up. Just give me one second here. <clears throat> All right, how's that? Uh, we can see your slides. Awesome, perfect. Okay, uh, hi everyone. Um, thank you uh, first so much for having me here. Uh, it's, it's a real honor to be able to uh, teach at the IADF school. Um, I guess good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. Uh, it's 5 a.m. Uh, where I am, and I, I have a bit of a cold, so uh, please please bear with me uh, for any slip ups as we get started here. Um, so yeah, just, just I guess to reintroduce myself uh, a little bit after that uh, great introduction. Um, I'm a research scientist on Microsoft's uh, AI for a good research team. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about what we do, um, you can visit this link, aka.ms uh, forward slash GOML. Um, personally, I focus mainly on geospatial machine mapping, uh, machine learning problems. Um, it, but others on the group do um, kind of applied research problems in a variety of different subject areas. Um, so for this um, this section, um, I'll be giving a presentation on Torch Geo. Um, then we can uh, potentially break for a few minutes. Uh, then a, a presentation on just uh, change detection in general. Um, and then the last third uh, can be, or actually probably more than a third can be a practical hands-on session uh, where I've prepared a <clears throat> demo notebook that walks us through uh, how to tackle change detection on one of the data sets that uh, comes with uh, Torch Geo. Um, and we do a variety of exercises uh, around that. Great. Um, so to get started um, with uh, Torch Geo, uh, this started last summer as a uh, collaboration between uh, myself uh, and Adam uh, Stewart, who was an intern with us. Um, we've been working on the project um, ever since then, and it's really grown um, sort of uh, organically. 
Uh, so here is the author list on the paper that we wrote that will be published in uh, SIG Spatial and presented in uh, a couple of months here. Um, and really the motivation behind TorchGeo is that we're not reaching the full potential of machine learning in remote sensing. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, in other sort of uh, cross domains like machine learning and vision, uh, machine learning and uh, uh, text or uh, even audio, there are a lot of sort of infrastructure libraries like Torch Vision, OpenCV, Detectron, um, variety of different APIs uh, that you can call that uh, go into kind of cloud um, hosted models um, and, and so on. Uh, in addition, you have a, a ton of pre-trained models. Um, you can get ImageNet pre-trained weights for almost any type of uh, deep learning architecture out there. Um, you can get weights for other um, types of tasks like semantic segmentation tasks, pre-trained non-cityscapes, uh, and so on. And this leads to a situation where if you have new data um, with that is pertaining to some sort of vision task, uh, you can kind of pick up a pre-trained model using any of these uh, existing libraries and get a result that's uh, often uh, not, not terrible. Um, and again, you know, the same, same holds for uh, kind of text domain. Uh, there are plenty of libraries and kind of training recipes that just work. Uh, the same thing with audio as well. Um, but the problem is that uh, we, we don't have the same thing for uh, the intersection of machine learning and remote sensing. There are really uh, not a lot of generic libraries. Um, the, uh, kind of ben the state of benchmarks is quite poor. Uh, and to make things more complicated, actually working with remotely sensed data, like satellite imagery or aerial imagery, um, there are a lot of little things that you need to pay attention to um, or, or nothing will <laughs> end up working out. Um, and even though it looks kind of similar to vision data, that many times uh, it really isn't. And these are things like coordinate systems, um, these kind of giant files that uh, the kind of data format that you save them in uh, matters, uh, and then just a variety of different data types uh, that encompass the, the whole field of remote sensing. Um, so what we're trying to do with Torch Geo is uh, create a Python library that lets you use remotely sensed data more easily with PyTorch uh, specifically. Uh, and to do this, we provide a couple of different things. Uh, the first are uh, data loaders for uh, a lot of common benchmark data sets um, from throughout the literature. Um, these are from tasks of all different types. Um, data loaders uh, and uh, samplers for those uh, data sets uh, for uh, generic raster uh, and data layer types. Transforms that uh, pay attention to multispectral imagery and geospatial data in general. Um, one thing uh, about really sense data is that often it has more than just the red, green, blue channels uh, that you get with vision data. Um, and kind of existing packages don't often work uh, out of the box with the multispectral imagery. Um, and then finally, pre trained models uh, and benchmark results over a variety of different data sets. Um, they can hopefully start as a uh, kind of bootstrapped position for others to build on our work. Um, and then importantly, uh, Torch Geo is open source uh, and really a production quality package. Um, so hopefully it is easy to maintain moving forward um, and it's easy for the community to contribute. Um, so just a couple a uh, couple things about Torch Geo. Um, the GitHub is out there. <laughs> you can find it really easy if you just search for Torch Geo. Uh, it's github.com slash Microsoft slash Torch Geo. Uh, we have uh, documentation live uh, in a archive paper that describes what we're doing um, that, again, will be published at SIG Spatial uh, next month. Um, and if you want to uh, install Torch Geo, we'll do this later on um, in the practical part, but you can uh, pip install it. You can install it from uh, Conda using the Conda Forge channel, uh, or you can install it using SPAC. Um, as of... <clears throat> uh, Earlier this month, actually, so this is, should be 10.02.2022, uh, um, Torchio had uh, just over 1,000 stars on GitHub, um, 2,000 downloads last month through uh, PIP, uh, 4,700 total downloads through Conda with uh, around 750 active users on the documentation page. Um, and we have actually quite a few contributors now. There are 23 unique contributors. 
Um, and people have viewed the documentation page from all around the world. Uh, we're at 144 countries. And this chart just shows the breakdown of the distribution of the uh, top 10 countries that users visit the documentation page from. Um, so now uh, to a little bit more about the types of problems that Torch Geo is aiming to solve uh, and how we do that. Um, the first is in uh, sampling pixel lined patches uh, from raster data. Um, so earlier I talked a little bit about the sort of different types of difficulties that uh, come up when using remotely sensed data, particularly satellite or aerial imagery. Um, and in contrast to normal uh, kind of computer vision problems, um, where you have uh, images that have three channels that are red, green, and blue, um, with remotely sensed imagery, uh, you can have <clears throat> uh, many different channels or spectral bands. For example, the uh, Landsat 8 um, platform uh, will give you 11 different bands. Uh, kind of hyperspectral imagery will uh, give you many, many more, um, so hundreds. Um, these bands capture different uh, wavelengths, so different uh, sections of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, they do so at different spatial resolutions, so each pixel in your resulting image will represent different um, sizes uh, on Earth. Um, for example, the GOES satellite will give you four kilometers per pixel, while a Maxar kind of commercial high resolution imagery can get as low as uh, 30 centimeters a pixel. And you can have drone imagery that's um, kind of very, very high resolution, less than a centimeter per pixel. Um, different satellites will capture imagery over the planet at different temporal resolutions. Um, so uh, some revisit rates might be like uh, every other week. Uh, every week uh, you get a new image of the same location on Earth. Um, and that data might be distributed in uh, many different formats. Uh, for example, GOT, if, uh, netcdf, czar, .image, .hdr. Uh, and if you're kind of new to the field, this can be quite overwhelming. Um, and then finally, kind of importantly, the uh, raster data that you get will be mapped to actual physical locations on the planet uh, in different ways uh, with this, uh, what known as a coordinate reference system. Um, so you know, to summarize this, you have to keep track of many of these things to actually just use remotely sensed data uh, in the first place. Um, and this leads to the pixel alignment problem. Uh, so in you know, many cases, what we want to do when we have uh, remotely sensed imagery uh, and some sort of uh, label source or supervision source is to uh, take one layer and use that as an input, take other layer and use that as uh, a target. Um, and if these layers come in different kind of coordinate systems with different spatial resolutions, um, then this can be a non-trivial task. So for example, here, um, I have a, a layer called A that contains a tile of Landsat 8 imagery uh, shown here. Um, it's intersecting you know, spatially this layer uh, B, which has uh, data from the cropland data layer. Um, and both of these are in different coordinate systems. <laughs> so if we wanted to train um, some sort of model that took as input this Landsat 8 imagery um, and tried to kind of regress to these cropland data layer labels, um, we wouldn't be able to just naively do that. We couldn't just load this um, as an array into our program and load the cropland data layer as another array, um, as we wouldn't know which you know, pixel offsets in A would correspond to which pixel offsets uh, in B. Um, so even though uh, the the data the two data layers have this kind of intersecting area. Um, if we if we zoom into one part of it, uh, these are what the kind of pixels from the corresponding layers would look like. Um, they're rotated and offset versions of each other. And what we really want to do is um, kind of sample patches from this intersection that where uh, the kind of top left pixel of the patch of the Landsat 8 layer or the, the patch that we've sampled corresponds to the top left pixel of the cropland data layer patch that we've sampled. Uh, and if you can do that, um, uh, that's what we call um, pixel-aligned uh, pixel patches. 
And I forgot to say uh, at the beginning, if anyone has any questions, uh, please, please just jump in and interrupt me. Uh, maybe now is a good time to stop. So, uh, any questions so far? Let me see if I can see the chat. <clears throat> okay, awesome. So um, here, here's just another example of this um, pixel alignment problem. Um, these four layers are all uh, in different projections and different spatial res resolutions. So even though they cover the same area on Earth, um, they're not Kind of particularly useful to us uh, if we're trying to use them to train uh, a deep learning model or any sort of machine learning model. Um, however, if we kind of rotate and um, reproject them all the same way, uh, then they do become aligned and now um, they are useful. Um, so to do this step um, without TorchGeo, uh, you have to use uh, command line calls or sort of mainly manually do this with GIF software. Uh, and more importantly, you have to know what to do. Um, and this um, can cause uh, a lot of different bugs. Uh, if you're reprojecting all of your different data layers and you have sort of a ton of data, this can lead to uh, duplicated data that is a waste of storage space. Um, it's not exactly cheap to reproject all the data if you're not going to use it. Um, and then again, there are so many different bugs that can crop up uh, if you're doing this improperly. Uh, so uh, as an example, if you wanted to uh, kind of crop this CDL layer here that I'm showing to the kind of extent and bounds, reprojecting crop it to the extent and bounds uh, and coordinate system of the Landsat 8 scene that we have, uh, this would be the kind of the command line invocation to do this. Um, and like, again, if you're not, uh, kind of well versed in what GDAL is or how to install GDAL or even you know, what commands to even start with, uh, this is going to be quite difficult for you to get to uh, just by <clears throat> Googling different things. Um, so, what we're doing in Torch Geo is uh, sort of this process uh, completely on the fly. Uh, in a way that's hopefully abstracted out from the user enough so that they don't have to kind of know about this at all. Uh, so what this code sample here is showing um, is how this works uh, for exactly that Landsat 8 and CDL uh, example um, that, that I was showing previously. Uh, so you instantiate a Landsat 8 uh, data set um, as just a, a PyTorch data set. Uh, you pass it the root directory in your file system where um, all your data files can be found and which bands you want to load in. Uh, then you instantiate a CDL data set kind of the same way. Um, and you can also automatically download uh, CDL if you'd like. Then you create from these two a intersection data set um, by saying data set equals uh, Landsat 8 and CDL. Um, so now we have this sort of um, abstract way of thinking about the intersection spatially uh, and temporally between these two. We define a random uh, geographic sampler that takes the that data set that we just created as input. Um, we say we want to sample um, patches of size 256 pixels. Uh, we want to sample 10,000 of them. And then we use both that data set and that sampler uh, in a PyTorch data loader um, with this kind of additional collate function um, that we also provide uh, that gives you a normal <clears throat> PyTorch data loader that does uh, exactly the sampling process that'll sample exactly for where these have uh, an intersection area um, and the patches that are returned by it will be pixel lines of uh, size 256 by 256 where uh, the image will be from Landsat 8 uh, and the mask will be from CDL. Um, and, that, and that's it then you can use these to train uh, a deep learning model um, and not have to worry anymore about the projection or uh, if you're doing it correctly or uh, anything like that. 
any any questions on this? I was wondering if the projection you talked about can be understood as a fine matrices with different parameters uh, because of different uh, reference coordinate systems. Uh, yeah, great question. Uh, I think that's exactly how they're um, uh, they're stored. Um, so if you're familiar with the raster IO library, uh, if you open up uh, one of the rasters with that, um, it'll have a property uh, f dot transform uh, that's exactly in a fine matrix. And that encodes the pixel resolution uh, in the top left corner, uh, top left corner of the data set. Uh, Alexander asked, does Torchio still use GL under the hood? Uh, yes, yes, it does. And we interact with the data sets with the raster IO library specifically. Did that answer uh, both your questions? <clears throat> I mean, yeah, this is just uh, an example of uh, one such patch uh, sampled from uh, both of those locations. Um, so the next thing uh, that Torchio does, uh, and this is still in very much an active development, is allows uh, the user to load uh, non-ImageNet pre-trained weights from uh, different different architectures. Um, so I. One of kind of the key features of Torch Vision uh, for me uh, and in other libraries that sort of provide architecture definitions uh, is the ability to load weights for those architectures that have been pre-trained on some uh, data set. Uh, and traditionally, um, their weights will be pre-trained on ImageNet, uh, such that uh, transfer learning tasks using those weight, uh, weights are uh, usually very, very effective. Uh, so, for example, from Torch Vision, uh, if you do uh, from torchvision.models.resnet uh, import ResNet 50, um, then you can get a ResNet 50 that has been pre-trained. Uh, and what pre-trained equals true here means that it's been pre-trained on ImageNet. And then if you were to fine-tune this model on some task that you cared about with a smaller amount of data, um, usually this, this would be um, a quite, quite a good place to start, much better so than uh, just a random initialization of the weights. Um, I see in the chat, can one define which of the images to be aligned um, is the source? <clears throat> uh, I don't know if you can define which image is the source, but you can define the um, uh, CRS and resolution that uh, everything gets warped to. And I believe the first image that uh, the intersection data set runs into, uh, for example, whatever the first patch in Landsat 8 will be taken as that. Uh, default if you don't provide one. Great. Um, so one, one thing about ImageNet is that, again, it uh, just uses uh, red, green, blue uh, as its input channels. Uh, so there's no, no real reason why these, image, these weights would be a good place to start um, if you're working with uh, satellite uh, imagery that's multispectral, for example. Um, so in Torchio, uh, you can do from torchio.models.res that import ResNet 50, um, exactly similar to the Torch Vision library. Um, however, uh, specify the sensor, the platform that you want, Sentinel 2, um, and then which set of, uh, what band combination you want to use. Um, and for right now, I think this is the only one that we have implemented uh, Sentinel 2 with all bands. Um, but this will give you pre-trained weights to start with that are more specific to uh, Sentinel 2 imagery um, than they are to like sort of all natural images in, in ResNet 50. Um, question? Do you want to just kind of uh, unmute and ask your question? For parameter sensor equals sensor two, are there other sources? Um, I don't believe there are other sources right now, um, but we've kind of sort of set this up as a way that once we have 
an effective way to pre-train um, on different imagery sources, we can release them quite easily. Uh, so one thing in particular that we're interested in is uh, self-supervised learning. Um, if we can create a self-supervised method that allows us to train different architectures on different uh, imagery without labels, um, then it'll be relatively easy to get a set of weights for each of these. Um, however, in the literature, I don't think there's a, a single self-supervised method that works generally or convincingly for uh, geospatial uh, imagery yet. Uh, great, great question. Uh, any any other questions here? That also gives me time to drink coffee. Um, <clears throat> so, question: Is the central to from a particular area and acquisition time? Can we define those parameters? Um, the central to weights that we have currently, I think come from a supervised data set, um, maybe Eurosat, uh, I might be wrong on that. Um, and what we're moving towards, and this is like literally under active development right now, is uh, a way to follow uh, Torch Vision's new um, pre-training weight API uh, such that you will be able to differentiate between different sets of pre-trained weights for even kind of sensor sensible to bands all. Uh, you might say like version Eurosat or version SSL one or something like that. Uh, does Zerstio work for central one complex values? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I imagine if you have yeah, bigger than that is a data set that we have in, uh, in Torch Geo. Uh, Bruno? Um, for uh, central one complex values, uh, if those are represented um, just as geotiffs, then yes, Torch Geo can use them. So Torch Geo has uh, a, um, a data set, a uh, generic data set that we call raster data set um, that you can instantiate uh, using kind of any, any geotiff. Yeah, great questions. Okay, so on to sort of the next uh, next section, uh, benchmark results with Torch Geo. Uh, so uh, one thing, uh, one part of the library uh, that I think is uh, actually particularly useful uh, is that we've implemented uh, a bunch of PyTorch data loaders for uh, existing uh, remotely sensed data sets. Uh, and actually, uh, one thing that I can do here is go to the Torch Geo documentation page. And I'll switch over to this. Uh, just give me one second. <clears throat> uh, so this is what uh, Torch Geo's uh, documentation looks like. Um, let me zoom in to make it a little bit bigger for everybody. Uh, and if you go down to uh, Torch Geo dot data sets, um, you can see we have different types of data sets, uh, geospatial data sets, um, for things, uh, for data sets that we've implemented that come with this sort of ability to um, uh, join in the way that I showed previously with like the and symbol, uh, you can create uh, intersection data sets or union data sets with any of these. Um, and then a set of data sets uh, that we call non geospatial data sets that are sort of the benchmark data sets from uh, the literature that you uh, might want to use in a research paper. Um, so any of these you can uh, just instantiate really easily. Uh, so you can say like big earth net uh, is a data set and you can say download equals true uh, and say we want to use the training split and give a band combination that you want to load uh, and then that will. Uh, just handle all the loading for you easily. Uh, and then this is all the different non geospatial data sets that we've implemented. Um, so if you want to learn or more or look to see if your favorite data set has been implemented, uh, you, can, you can check there. 
Um, and the cool thing about uh, these is they provide uh, features like uh, auto downloading. Uh, if you've ever used Torch Vision, you know, uh, if you want to use like the MNIST library or uh, the MNIST data set, you can say, uh, give me MNIST with download equals true, and it'll go download the data set for you. You don't have to worry about that. Um, for many of the data sets that we have implemented, uh, if it's possible, uh, we include that feature. Um, we have features for plotting uh, individual samples from each data set. Um, and these come from a variety of different tasks, uh, like scene classification, um, sort of regression from a patch, uh, semantic segmentation problems, instance segmentation problems, um, and change detection problems. And we'll use one of the change detection data sets later on in this. Um, and it's also cool because these are all provided through a consistent interface. Um, so if you want to do experiments over um, uh, many different data sets, uh, that's possible without changing a lot of code on your end. Um, and one of the reasons why I think this is particularly important for the remotely sensed community um, is so that we can start building out uh, a set of uh, results on data sets that uh, have a consistent kind of train validation and test set uh, specified. Um, so when I, I was making this talk, I think early last year, um, all of the papers that I looked at uh, that pr uh, provided results on Big EarthNet didn't have a set of comparable results. Um, so I looked at these four papers here um, and all of the results from all those papers kind of looked great, right? Uh, they all they all wanted to say that their method or whatever they were doing uh, was good, um, but they all defined the train and test splits uh, that they used on Big EarthNet uh, in slightly different ways. Um, some of them uh, reported different metrics. Uh, some of them used different imagery for train valve test. Um, uh, one of them ignored cloudy and snowy images. Uh, another just used images uh, from Ireland uh, for some reason. Um, and that makes it such that you, uh, if you want to kind of know which is the best way to train a model uh, on data that looks like Big EarthNet, i.e. Uh, Central 2 uh, and Central 1 data, uh, you, you can't really know that from the set. And one thing that we're hoping that Torch Geo does is uh, allow people to kind of standardize on a way to load these data sets uh, such that the results will be comparable. Uh, and the question that we asked in our paper is uh, how do a set of kind of very simple models perform uh, across uh, some of these data sets? Uh, and we try to do this in a way that's um, kind of more modern. Um, we're reporting uncertainty over different training runs. Uh, we use kind of very simple models, ResNets, or for semantic segmentation uh, data sets, Usenets with a ResNet backbone, um, all reproducible code uh, from uh, our GitHub. Uh, and then we compare things like pre-training on ImageNet versus no pre-training uh, using all the multispectral bands versus only using RGB bands uh, and other things like that. Um, so any, I guess, before we jump into the results, you know, any question on setup or motivation here? And I'll keep asking this because I, I still have coffee. Okay. Um, so this is the set of results um, that we reported in the paper. Uh, we might have expanded this uh, a little bit, but I, I think essentially this is this is it, where we're testing on different data sets, um, and then the rows are representing different methods that we've tested. So, um, for example, on this uh, ResNet 45 data set, we've tested a uh, ResNet 50 with uh, ImageNet weight initialization. Um, this data set only has RGB. We also test a ResNet 18 with a random weight initialization. Uh, and compared to the results that have been reported in the literature. So while the best uh, the best set of, of the previously reported results has been, I think, overall accuracy of 96.86%, um, if we just use a ResNet 50 that has been pre-trained on uh, ImageNet, um, we can get 95.4 uh, plus or minus 0.23. 
Uh, so that's how to interpret this table. Um, and if you look at some of the data sets, um, like this uh, SO2 SAD data set, um, our results are tying sort of the reported state of the art performance. Um, we observe sort of very large uh, standard deviations in test performance over different training runs. Uh, so there's a high amount of variability um, depending on which random seed that you're using for training, um, which suggests that uh, for data sets uh, like SO2 set, then you should actually report these um, kind of bounds over your test set performance to give kind of the readers in the literature a, a better idea of what the uh, distribution looks like. Um, and then here you can also see uh, in our results the importance of uh, pre-training. Um, so for example, if you train a ResNet 50 uh, on ImageNet, uh, with ImageNet pre-trained weights uh, using the multi-spectral uh, multi uh, bands, not just RGB bands, then you're getting a performance of around 64. Whereas uh, if you uh, do from random initialization, uh, the top performance here is only you know, 56.8. Uh, and same story for the RGB imagery, but just shifted down with ImageNet uh, 5960 with uh, random initialization 4950. Um, and then uh, on other data sets, um, we're not achieving you know, state-of-the-art results, but we get very close where the state-of-the-art results um, are kind of quite elaborate. Uh, so for example, here on the landcover.ai data set, um, this is a, a land cover mapping problem where the kind of paper that proposed it used a deep lab V3 plus um, for an encoder, they used an exception 71 with this dense prediction cell uh, feature and they pre-trained on cityscapes, which is a semantic segmentation data set, uh, and got a performance of 85.56. Uh, uh, I think that's mean IOU, um, and that's great. Um, but kind of one question that you might ask is, how does just a very, very simple um, model uh, perform on this? So if you use a UNet with a ResNet 50 encoder pre-trained on ImageNet, uh, you can get 84.8. You know, um, that just being 0.5 away once you account for the uncertainty interval. Um, so really our argument here is that to kind of really understand what uh, the state of the art on any kind of given data set is, uh, the, a, a very elaborate setup is great yeah, if it's getting good performance, but in order for us to measure like what that actually means, we need to know how very simple models uh, or simple approaches perform as well. Um, and then on other data sets, uh, we find that uh, even the basic approaches are getting kind of very close to perfect. Uh, and the recommendation here is that uh, you probably shouldn't use these types of data sets um, to benchmark methods on in the future as uh, you can't really discriminate well between uh, the of different methods because every method is performing well, or even simple methods are performing well. Uh, so here on Eurosat, uh, ResNet 50 pre-trained on ImageNet is getting you kind of 98.11 uh, accuracy, and the you know, state of the art is 99.2. Um, on UC Merced, similar story. Um, state of the art is 99.6. Very simple method gets you above 98. Um, and then uh, another question we asked uh, is how uh, ImageNet pre-training affects uh, generalization performance. Um, so in this setup, uh, we trained uh, land cover models on data from the state of Delaware in the US. And then we tested uh, the models on Delaware and on uh, other nearby states that we have the same sort of input output data for. So with a uh, initialization with ImageNet weights um, uh, versus random weights uh, on Delaware, they both look the same. Uh, you're getting around 69 mean IOU. Um, however, uh, if you look at the ImageNet weights for the other states, Maryland, New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, West Virginia, um, you're getting a much higher performance than if you have 
um, the, than the model with random initialization. So everywhere else, um, you're you're getting lower performance. So 57 versus 59, um, 49 versus 58, uh, and so on. So even though it looks like uh, if you just have data from Delaware that uh, you're you're performing equally as well, no matter if you initialize initialize with image net weights versus random weights, um, the spatial generalization of your model is much much better uh, when you have image net weights. Uh, and we take that as uh, some sort of signal that we should be following this direction of uh, generating uh, pre-trained weights for different kind of interesting band combinations for uh, common uh, satellite imagery and uh, aerial data sets, uh, such that we can get these uh, better generalization performances um, to solve many more downstream problems. Um, so that's all I have for Torch Geo uh, and, and the results that we got for Torch Geo. Um, I do want to step through the library a little bit more, um, but I guess here's another good spot that we can pause for questions. Any data sets? Uh, so new question, any data sets or pre-trained models for use cases with no spatial context? Um, for example, parcel level crop mapping where parcel pixels are aggregated to uh, one by channels uh, and not kind of patched imagery. Um, I don't think so. I'm not sure what a pre-trained, how you would, like, I'm not sure what um, benefit a pre-trained model would be if you just have a small vector of size, number of channels. So pre one reason why pre-trained models are um, useful is they perform sort of a feature engineering automatically to get some high dimensional input, like what you say, height by width by channels, uh, down to some lower dimensional representation, like uh, 512, or whatever the feature dimension of a model is. So I don't know if you only have, say you have like 11 channels, uh, C equals 11. Um, I don't know how you can transform that to be kind of more informative than just starting from those 11 values. Does, it, does that make sense, Stella? Um, next question, do you have a data sets with satellite image time series? Um, I believe a couple of them do have time series uh, information. Um, I know for sure, uh, let me bring this back over here. Um, there's one data set that um, does look into self-supervised pre-training with temporal information, a uh, seasonal contrast paper. Um, and here they have five points in time for each patch, for example. Uh, yes, I can share the slides with you. Do you want me to share them now or can I post them somewhere after? And I guess organizers, uh, is there a preference on that? About sharing slides. Upload to Tub Cloud. All right. Give me one second then. I'm going to stop sharing. So you can't read my Slack.
Um, how do I upload upload here? Is there any organizer on that knows how to do this? Ah, it looks like I have a non-read-only link, so I can use that instead of the other link. Let's see if that works. Okay, looks like it worked. Um, if you refresh, you should see a PDF there. Uh, if someone can confirm it, that would be great. Awesome. Thank you. All right, so maybe we can take um, just like a, a five minute break now uh, and then come back and we can talk more about change detection. So I will see you all in five minutes.
All right. Hi again, everybody. All my faceless black boxes are here. Give me one second to set up the slides again. All right, ready for part two? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> All right. So uh, in this uh, second section uh, is going to be relatively short, uh, but I just wanted to give a outline of what the change detection problem looks like uh, and some different <clears throat> uh, design choices that you might make uh, from a deep learning standpoint uh, if you have a change detection problem. Uh, so very high level, um, the change detection problem is where you're given a before and after uh, image of um, some location, uh, and the objective is to determine uh, what has changed. Uh, so for example, in this data set, uh, the mask on the far right shows uh, all of the buildings that have changed uh, in this uh, after image. Um, and there are uh, a ton a ton of variants of uh, this general problem. Uh, so for example, you can have a, <clears throat> uh, a time series of imagery instead of just a uh, before and after image. Um, the change that you're looking for uh, can, can be formatted in many different ways. Uh, you might care about just any change uh, in the imagery. Um, you, can, you might care about a, a targeted change, for example, uh, buildings that have changed where you don't care about other classes of change, or you might uh, care about um, sort of all the pairwise transitions that have happened from, for example, uh, forest before to um, building barren um grassland different different types of changes like that um, and then the actual uh problem itself can have uh many different facets as well so uh you might have uh, supervised data on what has changed uh, for example this mask here shows the buildings again um, you might have weekly supervised information or um, in kind of the any change category uh, you might be completely unsupervised. Uh, and then other issues that sort of make this problem, uh, that kind of add on to the problem are uh, issues of occlusion. Uh, do you care about trying to identify uh, changes that you might not even be able to see, um, uh, such as sort of roads going under um, tree canopy? <clears throat> um, are you having to deal with uh, domain adaptation issues where the before imagery and the after imagery look very different, or uh, maybe you're trying to uh, identify change in a location that's not uh, in your training set. Um, and then uh, maybe the images that you're using kind of before and after have uh, very different resolutions or come from different sensors. Um, how will you deal with that? Um, here is a case where um, kind of the before and after might have different um, uh, nadir angles. Uh, so what, what that means is when a, a satellite passes over um, an area, if it's taking uh, capturing an image that's directly below it, uh, we say it has a off nadir angle of, kind of zero degrees. However, if it's looking off to um, the side of the, uh, I guess, path that is circling the Earth in, um, you could have a off nadir angles of sort of positive or negative numbers. Um, and when this happens, you get sort of a skewed view of what's on the ground. And this is showing this case for, uh, I think, three different increasing off nadir angles of the same location. So in uh, example A over here on the left, uh, this is uh, off nadir angle of zero, uh, where the angle is increasing in both of these cases. And you can see more and more of the sides of the buildings. And this is just one of the dimensions which might um, 
fall into, I guess, the domain adaptation issue if you're having uh, imagery in the after case or the before case that has high off near angles. Um, is your model going to include this overlap as change or not? Uh, and how, how, you, how would you deal with that? Uh, let's see if I can bring chat back up to see if we have any questions. Um, and the reason we, we care about change detection uh, in general is that most of the applied problems um, uh, that actually I, that I've run into with um, satellite or aerial imagery are actually uh, change problems. Uh, so many of the people that uh, care about these types of problems don't just want a, <clears throat> uh, for example, a static layer of where all of the buildings are at time t. Uh, the thing they actually care about is how is the number of buildings changing over uh, this range from T to T plus uh, K, for example. Um, and uh, usually if you're talking with uh, someone who cares about this problem, the stakeholder or the customer, um, they, they will frame the problem that they care about as, for example, a building detection problem. However, uh, what that actually maps to if you're doing it over time is some variant of uh, this change detection problem, where if you had a perfect building detection model for all the scenarios um, that fall within that time range from the start of when they care about to the end of when they care about, um, you could kind of perfectly solve this change detection problem just by running your building model over each uh, layer of imagery in between. Um, but when that becomes difficult, uh, it's interesting to look at uh, some of these approaches that are specific to change detection. Um, other examples are, uh, for example, building damage assessment problems <clears throat> where you have kind of before and after image, um, where the after image, some kind of natural disaster, man-made disaster has happened and you want to identify um, kind of damages to structures uh, to inform uh, rebuilding. Um, aid allocation, uh, urban growth problems where you're trying to monitor how kind of area is growing over time or uh, maybe how uh, conservation uh, interventions are helping um, an area not to lose different types of land cover over time. And crop mapping uh, can be considered a change detection problem. A renewable energy mapping is something that you usually want to do over time <clears throat> and then uh, kind of uh, looking how uh, different water resources are changing over time is, uh, again, another very important problem. And again, these all, all are in the change category. Um, so now, now on to how, uh, basically how to model uh, these change detection problems uh, from a, a deep learning uh, point of view. Uh, in my opinion, it really comes down to uh, a data fusion question. Um, and here, the sub-questions are, uh, when do you want to uh, fuse uh, the different layers of imagery or the different types of imagery that you have? Uh, and the second sub-question is how to fuse it. Um, in, in this figure, um, there are just three, um, a couple of different uh, or a few more different ways that you might choose to fuse your data information. Uh, and what I mean by that is if you have a before and after image, how do you combine them in the uh, modeling framework? So in uh, early fusion, uh, for example, uh, down here are your inputs. Um, and the strategy with early fusion is to fuse uh, all of your inputs together before you pass them into the model. Um, so if you have before or after imagery like this, um, you can concatenate them, for example, along the channel dimension. Uh, so this is height, uh, width, and there are, say, three channels um, in this image, height, width, three channels in this image, you would create a, a new uh, image quote unquote, that had a uh, height, width, and uh, six channels. And then uh, in the early fusion, that would be the input into your model. Uh, and the output would be, for example, the change mask that we were looking at a, a couple slides back. 
um, for late fusion, you would have uh, independently the images being fed into um, some sort of subcomponent of your network. Uh, and then later on in the modeling process or the network architecture process, you can find the feature representations um, that were generated by those uh, subcomponents in some different way, uh, traditionally by uh, concatenating them together, subtracting them, or maybe even uh, adding them, uh, and then doing a more, at it having more layers that operate on top of that confused representation. Um, and then you can also do things uh, like slow fusion, where you're progressively, uh, if you have more than two inputs, you can progressively combine um, them together. Or uh, there are other strategies like mid fusion, where uh, you combine the feature representations kind of midway through the architecture uh, and then have uh, kind of more in depth modeling uh, on top of them versus in late fusion, where you're usually making just a decision. Uh, directly on the fused feature representation. Any questions on this? Um, so here is just a, another way to look at, could also do no fusion and just compare inference outputs over time. Yep. Yeah, and I guess that's the, the scenario that I was referring to, that if you had uh, like a very a very good model that could operate with the same sort of performance over all of the different um, maybe time layers that you care about. You could just run, for example, a building detection model at time one and time two, and, and then directly compare the results. Um, but often in my experience is that the model doesn't behave the same way at time one and time two. Uh, so you might get a variety of different artifacts uh, if you're if you're trying to do that. Um, so here's here's just another way of um, looking at uh, early fusion, um, concatenating along the channel dimension, passing that input into um, one network, uh, and then this network can be making a decision, for example, on the building change mask. It could be outputting a building change mask. Uh, another way of doing that would be having uh, one image get passed to um, network A, uh, the after image getting passed to a copy of network A, uh, fusing the representation either through concatenation or subtraction, uh, and then passing that fused representation through a second network, network B, uh, that makes, again, that output um, masked prediction. Um, and then when you're uh, kind of back propagating the uh, uh, gradient information, you're updating uh, the same uh, network here and here. Um, so your network A is trying to learn a feature representation that works well for both imagery from uh, before and imagery from after. Uh, another way you could also do that is have uh, different uh, copies of the network and update them independently. So network A, uh, before images would go into network A, after images would go into network B, um, you would fuse them in the same way that you did in this uh, scenario. Um, and then the uh, output network C would give you uh, a gradient signal that you can just pass through each branch. Does, is that clear? Does that make sense? Have I lost anybody? So if you have questions, uh, definitely please uh, speak up before we get to the 
the practical part. I don't want anybody to be lost. Um, question, uh, what will be the expected difference in both the architectures? Um, could you elaborate a little bit on, on the question? Ah, okay, so the question is, um, what is, in the case scenario that we're showing here, um, would you expect any differences between the architectures network A and network B? Um, yes, so, so I guess just comparing this network or this modeling setup with this modeling setup, um, if, you, if you have uh, inputs that are uh, very, very different from the before and after images here, you might go with this modeling setup where you have uh, independent weights for network A and network B, um, just because the uh, representations that you want these different networks to learn, you would expect would be quite different. Uh, for example, here, if the before images were like uh, very low resolution and the after images were high resolution and you still wanted to get an idea uh, of change and you had labels for this somehow, um, you would expect, if you, you wouldn't expect this modeling setup to work as well because this network would have to kind of do additional work to set, separate out what was low resolution input versus what was high resolution input. Um, here you're sort of specifying that these representations should be different. Whereas um, in this setup, if you had um, inputs that sort of look the same, have the same characteristics, uh, you're forcing here to there to be a single representation um, that works well for both of these. Great. Um, and then in general, um, like you, you could have differences between these networks, right? This could be um, a like small fully convolutional network. This could be a more involved uh, unit. Uh, if you did uh, have this one was low resolution, this one was high resolution. You might that might be an appropriate modeling choice. Um, other questions: Can we frame change detection as a ranking problem? Um, I'm I'm not sure. What did What did you have in mind? But if you want to, you can just unmute uh, and directly ask the question. I see you unmuted, but I can't hear you. Um, as moving on just temporarily to a uh, different question, uh, does the network support multi-resolution data from different sensors? Um, yes, you could set up the problem uh, that way, uh, if you wanted. So, for example, uh, if you had uh, maybe kind of SAR data um, from kind of a pre disaster, or you, you had actually more realistic setup, you, you had uh, kind of multi spectral data for before a disaster, uh, and then say a hurricane hit. Um, and it was very cloudy, so it was hard to get um, multispectral data because the clouds were blocking it. 
Um, but you could, for example, get uh, SAR, uh, SAR data location. So one change detection uh, problem instance that you might be interested in is where the before imagery is multispectral, the after imagery is uh, SAR. Um, and in that case, you would want to have <clears throat> different networks for the before imagery and the after imagery, or you would want to do an early fusion where you can just combine them together and let the uh, single network sort out the differences. Uh, then you wouldn't want this situation. Um, but there's not like a network that supports multi-resolution data. These are sort of design decisions that you have to make that are dependent on the type of change detection problem that you have. Um, and then, uh, Hassan, uh, did you want to network A and B has the same weights? Um, no, in this situation, I'm I'm giving networks different letters um, if they have different weights. So in, in this setup, network A, B, and C would all have different weights. Um, however, uh, this is also a common set, setup where network A uh, where, where the network that takes both the before and after imagery is the same network. Uh, this is like common in like Siamese, uh, uh, the, the problem where you would see this pop up is like Siamese networks. I um, mean, did you want to exp um, kind of elaborate more on the change detection as a ranking problem question? Yeah, could, could you uh, just kind of share more of your thoughts on that question? Like, what did you have in mind? I I don't think I'm following you, but maybe we can follow up um, during the practical or um, during during a break. Uh, okay, different question um, from Bruno. Uh, in your experience, do Siamese networks perform better than having A and B networks? Um, again, it depends on the type of problem that you're looking to solve. So if your before imagery is multispectral and your after imagery is SAR, I would not expect a Siamese network to perform well in that case at all, as it would have to learn how to convert both multispectral imagery and SAR data into some useful feature representation within the same network. Um, but if instead of Instead of a Siamese network, I would choose this modeling setup where I had two networks, uh, one network specifically for the multispectral input, uh, multispectral input, one network specifically for the SAR input, uh, and then do late fusion uh, on both. Or I would do, um, well, I would always try early fusion. Um, as that, I think, is technically the easiest to implement um, as a baseline. Uh, but I definitely wouldn't expect that to work. Uh, I wouldn't expect a Siamese model to work, sorry. Cool. 
A uh, quick question on using different sensors for before and after. Uh, the before and after images should be uh, resampled to the same size. Uh, is this done in a pre-processing step? <clears throat> uh, yeah, great question. So if your before and after images are different sizes, for example, say your before image comes from um, Landsat uh, that has a 30 meter uh, per pixel resolution, uh, and your after image is, for example, from Sentinel, which has 10 meter per pixel resolution. Uh, one thing that you could do is use, uh, for example, Deutsch Geo um, to sample pixel aligned images where you're um, upsampling the Landsat data to pretend like it's 10 meter per pixel. Um, or you could, uh, again, do us uh, lost it. Uh, set up like this, where you have different sort of encoders for the different sized imagery um, that have the same output representation size. <clears throat> and really, uh, I think that choice would be more um, experimental. Um, like you, you, you would want to experiment uh, if you have a change detection problem with this sort of setup um, versus uh, a late fusion setup, uh, and then you would also want to experiment with different ways to combine the feature representations, um, like concatenating them or subtracting them or so on. Um, new question, what best practices are there to harmonize acquisitions over different atmospheric conditions, which may falsify changes detected? Um, could you give an example, Stella? I think I know what you mean. Um, just wanted to double check. Like for example, if one image is cloudy uh, and the after images clear, um, how do you make sure that you're not like picking up all the clouds as change, like false positive change? Uh, adding to that, still how to harmonize for different elimination conditions over different seasons. Was was that a cloudy example? Did that fit your your question, Stella? Um, okay, uh, Stella said yes. So, um, in in that case, if you're expecting kind of different atmospheric conditions like clouds or haze to interfere with your model, um, I guess they're are two ways that come to mind uh, to approach it. Um, one is just uh, hoping that based on your training data, the network uh, can learn to uh, ignore those clouds. So for example, if you have a labeled data set, some of your um, before and after image pairs have uh, clouds in them, but none of those are labeled as change, whereas all like all the buildings are labeled as change. Um, your network might learn to ignore situations where you have clouds in one, uh, not clouds in the other, and uh, that being labeled as no change. Um, one thing you can do to encourage the model just to learn that is by augmenting um, your before and after images by like whiting out part of your before or part of your after image randomly and then marking that area uh, in the mask as no change. Um, another way that you could do it is um, by trying to sort of manually account for the different types of conditions that would come up. Um, for example, by training a separate like cloud detection model um, and then using that to mask, like running that independently on your before and after images and using all the places that it detected as cloudy um, as a mask to just enforce the no change label uh, from your change detection model. Um, and then going to, uh, sorry, Sharad's um, question, how to harmonize for different illumination conditions over different seasons. Um, 
that to me would be more just of a general domain adaptation problem um, where, again, you would want to tackle that with um, different augmentation methods to try to expose your model to as many different elimination conditions as possible uh, in the training data set um, or kind of directly including uh, as much as many images as possible in your training set or potentially even like pre-training on uh, pre-training your encoders here like network a and network b uh, on large data sets that include all of those conditions before fine tuning to your change problem specifically and let me know if you want me to elaborate on kind of any of those points Uh, another way that uh, I've seen this tackled in the literature is that if you have sort of additional labels per image on sort of the conditions of that image, you can enforce you can force your network to um, not learn those labels uh, in order to be more sort of robust to things like seasonality. Um, so for what I mean by that, for example, is say that we don't have a change detection problem now. Say we're trying to do, uh, for example, land cover mapping um, uh, as a semantic segmentation problem from a data set of image images. And in your data set of imagery, you have images that come from a variety of different seasons, like maybe summer from the winter, summer from summer. Um, uh, so you, you observe a lot of uh, variation in your input. Um, however, you want to map kind of widely different kind of feature representations to the same types of land cover classes. Um, if for each of those images in your input data set, you have sort of accessory labels that tell you which season each image is from, you can train a network using those accessory labels as well um, to force the network to not learn feature representations that are predictive of the season, um, but are predictive of the land cover classes. And by doing that, you're you're trying to encode the fact that the season, that uh, what season the input image comes from shouldn't matter in your output representation. And in general, that improves sort of like the robustness of your model to different variations. And if you didn't do that, your model could easily pick up on the fact that uh, like, like different shortcuts in the data sets, like maybe all the images that come from the summer season, for example, have a lot of water in them. Um, that, that would be sort of a, a false signal that a model could pick up on. So this is kind of very far off the change detection problem specifically, but uh, there are additionally many different ways that you can control for sort of the, the sources of variance that come up in just modeling generally with um, remotely sensed data. Um, new question, do we need equal number of bands in both networks? Um, in the case scenario that I'm showing on the screen here, where the network for the in, uh, input one and input two, or the before and after, are different, no, those can be um, completely different. Um, but if you're doing a Siamese modeling approach like this, um, then they should be the same as network A is only going to know how to interpret um kind of one type of input these are all great questions any other questions keep them coming no problem
any disagreements? Is anyone listening and being like, no, that's completely wrong? Okay, I guess that's good. <laughs> um, so moving on. Um, so I guess where am I here? I, so the, the point here, uh, I got this table from a recent survey paper and remote sensing uh, survey on deep learning based change detection from high resolution remote sensing images. Um, there, there are just a lot of existing data sets uh, out there that you can uh, use uh, to pre-train on if you have sort of a new change detection problem that you're interested in, um, or if you're interested in developing methods um, for change detection in general, uh, there are a lot of choices um, that you can go to uh, to test out your, uh, your proposed approach, uh, which leads sort of directly into the practical where we'll be taking a, a change detection data set uh, from Torch Geo uh, that we've implemented in Torch Geo, we didn't create it, um, uh, and then running our own or training our own change detection model using this data set. Um, so that took about 30 minutes. Um, Maybe we can break now for about uh, 15 minutes. Uh, if anyone has other questions, um, I'll stick around. Or maybe, maybe we'll break for five minutes. I'll be back in five minutes. Um, and then if we have other questions about change detection in general, um, we can talk over that and then get um, directly into this practical session. Does that sound good? So I'll be back in five minutes um, and we'll pick up for the kind of practical part in 15 minutes. So at 6.45 a.m. here, plus 15 minutes, uh, uh, wherever you are. Can you paste link in chat box uh, to this notebook? Yes. Um, so this link is uh, will be the notebook that we um, base the practical on. Um, and I'll show you just interactively how you can load this into Google Colab. Uh, to start working on it. Okay, cool. Um, see you all in five minutes then.
All right, does anyone have uh, any other kind of questions on the change detection part or the torch deer part, I guess, um, before we get into the practical? Here's the link for the collab. Um, I will show um, how you can load uh, the the notebook that I linked to in collab. Can I ask a, a dumb question that probably has an intuitive, obvious answer if I read the documentation more thoroughly, but hopefully you can answer in 10 seconds? <laughs> sure. Uh, and and no, no dumb questions. Don't, don't be scared to ask anything. Does uh, Torch Geo have a hard dependency on Python, uh, excuse me, on PyTorch Lightning, or is that just a, a nice to have? Is it a must have or a nice to have when using uh, Torch Geo with Python, God, PyTorch Lightning? I think we have a hard dependency on PyTorch Lightning. Just let me double check though. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we have a hard dependency on Lightning. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, it's definitely in the environment YAML, which I'm guessing you're looking at too. It just, and so there, what I'm trying, I guess my point is, is, is there's no way to use uh, towards Geo without it, without lightning. Like, uh, well, I mean, I guess to say, like, if you were to, hey, let me let me actually use good good words with this. So I, I get it that as a dependency and it uses PyTorch Lightning under the hood, but when you leverage Torch Geo in your project, do you have to explicitly le use uh, PyTorch Lightning and, and code that uses Torch Geo uh, directly? Ah, I think I, I think I understand what you're saying. Um, so. So if you if you just want like the data sets, if you just want like a data loader for like Euro seven, for example, you don't have to use PyTorch Lightning. Like it'll be installed if you pip install Torch Geo, um, but you don't you don't have to use any of the features if you don't want to. The only part of Torch Geo which we use PyTorch Lightning features are in the data modules uh, and the trainers. So you're you're perfectly free to use like the raster data set or any any of the data sets or transforms or samplers um, without interacting with my torch lightning. I see that makes sense. Yeah, if you just download the data sets, then you don't need to care. But if you're gonna like you said, the, the trainers are one. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So what was the motivation? Like, did you are you trying to avoid PyTorch Lightning or? No, no, nothing, nothing so dark or, or whatnot. Uh, I'm looking at the, uh, I, I just have a personal uh, belief that just as a community, we don't necessarily keep track of our, our dependencies as, as well as I think we could. And so I, I like to know what comes with what, because not just because, well, I guess mostly because uh, like dependency resolution type thing. So if, if G Torch Geo is bringing in a, a dependency on an older version of PyTorch Geo or a newer version, and then you don't know, happen to resolve that stuff enough. But also as a benefit, if, if you get uh, Torch, if you're working in a, a sensitive environment with a closed enclave or something <clears> like that, and they approve Torch Geo for use, well, they often will implicitly approve the, the dependencies of it as well. So that would bring PyTorch Lightning into the, the field. And so then you think, okay, that's a, a plus one in the, the, the column of leveraging PyTorch Lightning. So sorry, it's a very tangled web, but I, I was curious, if you have a moment later, I'd be interested in your thoughts on PyTorch Lightning as you've used it within the Torch Geo as well. Over. Yeah, sure. Um, I also say, like, one of, I think, the um, contributions of Torch Geo just in general is the way that we're, uh, like, obsessive about tracking the dependencies and what works and what doesn't work. Um, so if you go to the GitHub uh, and you look at requirements, 
um, we have the required um, the requirements that are required, uh, and we have the sort of current version, or the the latest version that has been tested with everything um, that's updated by Dependabot, uh, and then the minimum version uh, that we have tested for everything. Uh, maybe not there. Maybe here. Um, the minimum version that we know that works with everything. And then <clears throat> separately, we have requirements for uh, additional requirements that are nice to have for different data sets um, and for like styles and testing and so on. And I guess we, we could factor out like trainer requirements here as well. Uh, but since that's a core part of the library, we just have those in required. So anytime any uh, pull request happens, um, our our whole test suite is run, um, and we don't accept new contributions unless they have 100% test coverage, which is uh, very, very strict. But in that way, we know that when we add code to the library, it's going to work with all the requirements. And then anytime any requirement is updated, the tests run as well. So we know that Torchdio will still work. Um, it's a, a pretty elaborate setup to make sure that it's going to work with all of the changing requirements, um, which is actually a, a large overhead of just maintaining this. Yeah, that, that's great. I, I didn't notice the uh, the requirements folder. <laughs> so looking at that, that's that's terrific. I don't think I've I've seen someone take such a tack. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, and full credit to this goes to uh, Adam Stewart. He he's the real maintainer behind all of this. Um, uh, and all of this sort of like infrastructure work is is his doing. So as yeah. as a consequence of this, if you pip install Torch Geo, you're going to get uh, like Raster.io, um, I think Fiona, um, all all of the sort of I guess, uh, base geospatial libraries, uh, a version that all work together. And I, maybe I'm missing it, but what do you guys run your uh, your CI on? Do you just use uh, GitHub Actions or? Yep. Um, so example, oh. I can pull up uh, pull requests here. Um, so someone is trying to add a point geosampler um, and uh, let's go down to the bottom here. Um, this this is all running on GitHub Actions, so it's uh, failing a style check, it's failing flake eight check, it's passing MyPy, um, and then the tests are run on uh, Ubuntu, macOS, and Windows for Python's versions three point seven and up. Uh, but I think we skipped three point seven on Windows. I don't remember the reason. Uh, and then we also run it on the minimum version of the dependencies for, I think, Ubuntu something as well. So all, all of this has to pass before we can we can merge something back in. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. I, I see it now. I, I was looking for a, you know, a flat file config, but I, I guess that's, it's all internal to, to GitLab. I didn't, uh, I, didn't, I didn't think I could see it, but I can. I'm looking at it right now. So cool. Yeah. If you go to um, the dot GitHub directory, um, and then workflows, uh, test.yaml, you can see how that's all configured. Perfect. Forgot about the workflow. Awesome. Sorry about that. Thank you so much. No problem. Um, any, any other questions? Um, hello? Hi. Uh, Hi, so Colin. Is this thing working? Yep, okay, yes. Can. Perfect. Uh, yes, I just said. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, I think that you just answered it uh, at the beginning of the presentation. I just wanted to know if it was possible to create a geo data set from just, you know, any classical or generic image built from scratch that are geo referenced. I think like that. You know, just yeah. take the abstract classes and then you work with it and you just use the utilities of our geo. Um, they are or not. Uh, I, by the way, Jason, I think you're still unmuted. I'm still unmuted. I know that's not me. Yeah. So, are are you saying you want to use the geo data set with just any rasters? Yes, any rasters. Just take the one type of geo referencing, the resolution, the position, and then 
you create your geo data and everything is fine. Yep. Um, I th think we have an example. So two places we have an example of this, I think. So on the Torstio documents, um, there's this tutorial section. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> And uh, the custom raster data set tutorial, I think, is describing um, describing what you're looking for. Uh, mm -hmm. It explains like what what these data sets are, um, and then shows how you can use a raster data set. Um, downloading we're downloading Sentinel two imagery from the planetary computer. However, we're not using the Sentinel two mm -hmm. uh, data set but instead defining our own um, our own data set based off of raster data set that goes and uh, loads those images. Okay. Um, the way this works is through uh, file name globs and uh, regexes. If you don't want to use those, um, you can also just instantiate a raster data set directly with a root directory. Uh, and it'll go find all of the geotiffs in that root directory, uh, and like the data set will be made out of those. Uh, and I have an example of how this works in this different repository, where I have uh, just a a geotiff um, and a mask that is corresponding to that geotiff. Uh, and here I'm making a new data module, but uh, this is where I'm setting up the raster data set. So I make okay. a image data set, a raster data set for the image data set, where I'm, I'm just passing where that image geotiff lives. A uh, similar thing for the mask uh, data set. Uh, and then I'm creating, like I showed earlier on in the presentation, a new data set, which is the union of the image data set and the mask mm -hmm. data set. And okay. then when I sample patches from these, these will be aligned uh, uh, and, and just kind of operate how you, you might expect where there is, you get images and masks together. Okay. Okay, thanks. That's answered answer it perfectly. Uh, just another question. Is there, I'm not, a very, I'm not very good for the Oracle element and things like that. Usually I just take a Docker image that works and then I use Docker on uh, the Torch Geo. So is there any images in Docker that uh, makes you able to work on Torch Geo like in a click or is still in experiment? Um, or do you just have to recreate an image from scratch and from your requirements? No, we don't have any pre-built Docker images. Uh, I think I think someone was interested in, in doing that. Uh, yeah, I don't think we're interested in maintaining like Docker files mm -hmm. uh, in the Torch Geo package uh, itself. Um, but like, if you wanted to create and publish like a Torch Geo 0.3.1 Docker file based off of something, then uh, you're, you're more more than welcome to. Uh, <laughs> I already think about it. It's it's kind of a bad answer where someone's like asks if a feature exists. I'm like, no, nope, you can implement it. <laughs> which is quite obvious, but uh, but that, that's the state of the Docker file currently. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, any other questions before we get started on the the practical? If not, I will. Let me, let me just set this up.
Sorry, give me one second here. Okay, so you should all be able to see my slides again. Okay, there yeah, you should go see my slides. Um, so for, it's been, longer than 15 minutes, so we're good. Um, so for the practical, um, I have in mind to walk through an example of how you can use Torch Geo with the trainers included in Torch Geo to train a model on this um, Levier CD plus uh, change detection data set. Um, so this data set consists of around a thousand pairs of 1024 by 1024 RGB images with um, building change mask labels. Um, and then this uh, notebook has uh, is what we'll be kind of running through and modifying. Um, so we'll go over instructions on how to get this set up, either running locally uh, on your machine or using uh, Google Colab. Uh, and then the sort of mini assignments that we can work on are uh, just how to explore the data set, um, how you can change the augmentations that uh, you're training with, or maybe how you change like the model backbone uh, that you're using, for example. And I'll explain what all that means in just a second here. Uh, but just to go into a little bit more uh, details on what exists for this change detection data set. Um, I did a small uh, literature review, uh, and this paper, uh, paper number one, is the paper that introduced this uh, plus version of this data set. Uh, I think it had 17 citations, so I looked through the citations for um, results that built on uh, the results that were released in kind of this original paper, uh, and I'm showing, I think, all of them here. Uh, so. The things that are uh, with citation number one are kind of the results that are shown for this in the original data set. Um, and then there's these two other papers, uh, number two and number three, uh, that also have results. Um, and then just going through the notebook uh, that we're about to step through, like I used the exact same notebook um, and training uh, using that notebook, I was able to get a F1 score of uh, 0 0.8056, um, which is uh, top three, third place in the list of, kind of all published results on this data set. Um, so I, I hope this shows uh, kind of the benefit of using kind of well-maintained model architectures and sort of modern training approaches uh, when uh, just tackling one of these problems, right? The, the architecture that I'm using here is just a, a simple unit with a ResNet 50 uh, encoder that's pre-trained on ImageNet. Uh, and it's it's beating kind of all of these proposed methods, CDNet, StanNet, uh, Intelligent BCD, uh, like all, all of these things uh, are, it, it turns out, um, uh, maybe quite good, but um, they're they're not as good as just training with a crude set of augmentations with a very, very standard approach. Um, and this is a good baseline number, just like the numbers that I was showing with the Torch Geo results uh, that give us confidence that whatever uh, modeling choices are being made in this FHD method or the BIT method are actually showing some kind of significant improvements over what you can get with uh, just a unit. Does that make sense? Any questions there?
So maybe you'll be able to improve on this result uh, even more after after we're done today. Okay, so now um, I guess uh, question: Does anybody not have access to Google Colab? Like, if you if you click that link that I just put in the chat, um, are you are you able to access a Colab notebook? Or do you have another place that you can run a notebook from? So I'm going to assume yes, actually, because uh, if even if you don't, I don't know how I can help in that regard. Um, so we'll, we'll carry we'll carry on with uh, just the uh, notebooks. Uh, okay, so if you go to Google Colab, uh, you should be presented with this sort of uh, page. Um, and to load in that uh, GitHub example that I showed, we use Colab in the previous section. Perfect. Um, you can just go to that link that I pasted in the chat, um, copy paste it in here. Uh, if you press search, uh, it should just load directly into Colab. Um, and then one thing that you want to do um, before we run anything is just go to the runtime uh, dropdown, uh, manage, uh, not manage, no, uh, change runtime type, uh, make sure this is Python 3 and hardware accelerator. Uh, GPU, uh, and then press save. Um, and then in our first cell, we can pip install Torch Geo. This notebook was not authored by Google. Yep, it was authored by me. Um, first step is uh, pip install Torch Geo. Um, this is going to install version um, 0 0.3.1, which is the most. Can you repeat how to upload the code to Colab? Yes. Um, in this in this screen, if you click on the GitHub tab uh, and just paste that URL into that search bar and press uh, search, it should load for you. Yep. Um, and then installing Torch Geo is going to take a second. Um, and then at the end of the installation, it's going to ask you to restart your runtime again. So if you just press restart runtime uh, and then press yes, uh, uh, it'll restart and then you'll have Twitch Geo installed. So after that, you should be able to run uh, this first cell that has all these imports. Um, and then the second cell, uh, torch.cuda is available to make sure that you're using you have access to a GPU um, that should return true. I'll just wait wait a couple minutes for everyone to get to that step. <clears throat> um, and if you're not using Colab, if you're using your own sort of compute environment, um, I suggest using like a new virtual environment or a new Conda environment, uh, and then actually to you can do like Conda. Uh, Twitch Geo School Python Twitch Geo. Like that command should create you a new environment that's uh, installed with Twitch Geo. Is, is anyone using their own computer? Is everyone on Colab? I'm using Colab. I don't know about everybody else. Like uh, they were saying in the chat, we had we used Colab in the the previous session. Okay. And uh, looking at the the dependencies on the that block, I think it would, <laughs> given the time constraints, it might be a little little hairy to get it running locally. Yeah, that's that's why a new virtual environment or um, Conda environment is is important. 
Uh, okay. So I'll just assume everyone's done with that. Uh, this next cell is just uh, some experiment configuration parameters. Uh, so I'll run that. Uh, and then I'll run this next cell that downloads, that instantiates. Uh, what is this? Stop iteration. This is not going to work. Awesome. Is anyone else getting this error? Yes. <laughs> okay, we might have broken. Um, we might have broken the. So this is a Google Drive link. And if too many people download from a Google Drive link at once, uh google drive shuts it down yep that's exactly right colin i did not think of that okay let's try give me one second i'm going to stop sharing and i'm going to rehost their zip file somewhere else and maybe we can hack this to get it work override it a google drive download that's awesome Okay, this is going to take me like maybe five minutes. If you're just joining us, we've overloaded a Google Drive download link for the data set that we're going to use. I'm going to host a zip file of the data set somewhere else. Uh, we're going to see if we can patch that in.
Yeah, I don't. I don't think. Um, so for planning participation, <laughs> I don't think it'll work if you restart. This is a problem with the Google Drive link. So the data set is hosted on Google Drive, and we all tried to download it at once, and it's a relatively large data set. Um, so that overloaded the quota that Google Drive has for each file. Um, so what I'm going to do is rehost the zip file um, somewhere else that doesn't have a quota. And then I will give you all a command to put into your collab that will download it from this new place. Uh, and maybe we can get around that. Maybe not. If not, this is going to be a really short practical. Okay. Okay, so it is rehosted now. Okay, so I think this is going to work. Let me reshare my screen. Okay, so I'll paste this command in the chat. So you want to create a new cell underneath the experiment parameters cell um, and just paste that command in and then run it. And this is going to download the zip file. At eight megabytes a second. Okay, so we'll just give this, I guess, 10 minutes. Um, so if you could all, who are still with me, uh, get that started. And then we will do a manual download. And then let me know if uh, let me know if that's not working for anybody. Uh, well, I might be dumb again, but it's not working for me. Oh, that sucks. Oh, it's working for other people. I mean, it's good for other people. Crap, crap, just me. Did you paste the full full? command into a new cell? I sure did. Well, I mean, it's uh, giving me a resolving research, blah, 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 403 server failed to authenticate the request. What happens if you just, just try again, out of curiosity? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to turn off my VPN. That might be.
<clears throat> Estimates two hours from day. Hopefully that speeds up. The time, the time is fluctuating for me, uh, but I guess I can, um, I can show an example from a place where I already have this running in the meantime. Make this a little bit bigger. <clears throat> and I guess I can explain uh, some of this as well. So, batch size, learning rate, um, number of data loader workers, patch size. Um, so, patch size is probably the only thing here. Excellent. Um, the only thing here that we might want to Play, well, there, there are a couple parameters here that we might want to play with when we're experimenting. Um, the, the data set comes with images that are um, natively 1024 by 1024. Uh, and this patch size parameter is going to be what we, we do a random crop from the larger images. So you might want to change that. Uh, validation split is how much of the training data set, what percentage of the training data set we hold out uh, for validation. Um, and learning rate is usually a good parameter to vary and test over um, to see, figure out which, which learning rate parameter gives you best performance on the validation set and then use that in the, to retrain without a validation set for the test set. Um, so for those of you that were able to download through the Google Drive link, the output of that cell should look something like this, where we see that we have 637, uh, 637 images in our training data set, uh, 348 in the test split. Um, and this is the type of um, API that TorchGeo exposes for all of the non-Geo data sets. Uh, most of them have uh, predefined splits. Most of them have an ability to auto download uh, when you're not uh, giving a presentation. <laughs> uh, ability to check some against uh, the expected value to make sure your, your download hasn't been corrupted somehow. Uh, and then other, other parameters that are normal in Torch Vision uh, data loaders like uh, passing transforms directly to the data set. Um, so for the first exercise, um, we just want to uh, use Torch Geo features to plot examples from the training data set or the test data set, uh, just to get a feel for what the data looks like. Um, and you can do this directly with the Torch Geo data set object. So for those of you who have the data set, um, you can go ahead and try exercise one. For those that have it still downloading, my copy's not downloaded yet, so I don't know exactly what the commands will be. Um, but basically we just want to unzip it to the data directory and then run these commands with download equal false. Uh, check something equals true. For the record, I get public access is not permitted on the search account. Uh, did you copy it with the like uh, question? Everything following the question mark as well. Public access isn't permitted. 
Uh, however, this um, this part of the URL is called the SAS token, uh, and that should give you permissions to download that file. And if you don't have this in quotes, uh, you might run into that as well. There's some weird escaping going on. Okay, great. Uh, yes. Yeah, all that extra stuff is not just like uh, some weird parameters that were left over from when I copy paste this link. That's that's actually important. That's how um, Microsoft's um, blob storage on Azure does authentication. Well, yeah, yeah sure. I get that. Is the last uh, characters of your string are they two two? Uh, no. Yeah, it's getting truncated in the chat for me for some reason. Oh, okay. Or maybe, uh, maybe, maybe that's just the representation. Did everybody else been copy and link? Is that what they did? Ooh. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is the only place that I post it. Um, how else would I share it? Copying the chat to a terminal works for me. I got, I got it now. My, my coworker got the whole thing because I'm, I'm only seeing all the way up to uh. Well, not the entire URL, so that that explains that. <laughs> yeah, if you if you send uh, if you want to post your email publicly here, I can just email it to you. Or if you want to send it just to me through the chat, uh, then I can email it to you. Cell twelve gave me an error. Uh, it looks like you're far ahead. Uh, which one was that? Are you running on uh, Colab? And did you have the uh, load? Did you did the load extension TensorBoard give you any problem? So before that, interesting. Okay, hold on uh, just a second. Let me show the commands that are needed to unzip this. Um, so let's let's do these commands. Make dir data to move that to data to Whoa. Okay, hold on on the air. And I can't see your entire trace back, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. For everyone who's following with the wget path, um, here are the commands that you want to run. Okay, uh, Valentine, that looks like an install error. And it looks like you're in the Pangeo stable uh, kind of environment. 
and it look, I know it looks like you installed into the Torch Geo school kind of environment, but for some reason, you're when you're running it, it's looking at Pangeo stable for proj.db. Maybe do like a conda deactivate and restart your terminal uh, and then try activating the Torch Geo school and trying that again. How do you put this into a directory? Awesome. Yeah, so after your zip file is finished downloading, I guess just unzip it and then move the uh, Livier CD plus folder and the zip file to the data to directory. <laughs> okay, awesome, Jason. And then... Okay, that workaround worked. Uh, was everybody able to follow that? I'm guessing not. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, is it Ahmed? So you, you unzipped it, right? No. So if you run if you run ls okay uh, if you run ls like this, um, you should see some like levier cd plus dot zip with a question mark followed by a bunch of stuff. If you just copy paste that and run like unzip. And then quotation marks, uh, whatever you had in the copy paste, and run like that. Does that work? What happens when you run ls? Can you paste the output into the chat? Okay, um, what about ls space data2?
Okay, so if you run unzip data to that, what happens? Okay, awesome. Uh, is it Ali? And then if you, uh, after you've got it unzipped and moved to data two, if you change the data sets, the root to data two and download equals false, uh, are you able to run that cell? Great, you are off to the races. Um, so go ahead and work on exercise one, see if you can get the uh, example, an example from train data set to plot. And then I'll work on debugging for a few, a few more minutes, uh, and then we can move on. And apologies for this being a lot more bumpy uh, than it should be. I completely did not realize that the Google Drive quota issue would be a, a problem. Um, yeah, so under data to maybe, maybe try that. Like that. Perfect. And then after that finishes, you're going to want to run uh, data to that command. Uh, and then hopefully after you run after you change the root directory to data two on the data set cell, um, and then download equals false, it should be good to go. And then if anyone else is still with me after this uh, on the fly editing, we can, we can move on. Awesome. Have you ever uploaded a copy of a data set to a blob container and pass out a link with uh, Jupyter bang symbols to download it and hack it into a data directory during a presentation. Yes, yes, I will. Okay, so I'm going to assume from here everyone has the data set downloaded. If anyone doesn't, and by downloaded, I mean like you've been able to run this cell and you get output. Uh, if you don't speak now. Could you, could you scroll up just a, a smidgen? I, I I finally got the data and stuff. Now I'm sorry. Maybe I should just wait behind. Um, what are you What are you looking for? I got the data and now I'm doing the unzip and move part. Okay. Um, 
So yeah, the un unzip, you just unzip whatever. So the the steps here are running ls to see what files you have in your current directory. Um, or if you moved it to data two, you can look at data two. And then unzip, you just pass it the path to the zip file. So it'd be something like unzip data two. And then you would run that to unzip the folder. And then after that, you move just the levier dash CD plus directory to data two. So finally, when you run ls on data two, you should see the zip file and then a folder with the same name. Okay, it seems pretty straightforward. Thank you. Yep, no problem. And again, sorry, this is so messy, everybody. I'll give like one more minute. Okay, uh, so moving on to exercise one. Uh, each each data set object uh, in TorchGeo comes with a dot plot command. So if you do something like uh, train, the, uh, the instance of the data set object comes with dot plot. So if you do train data set dot plot, uh, this is going to be a function that expects a sample from the data set. So if we just look, around at the J set, we can do train data set uh, sub zero. If we run this, we're gonna get the first um, first item from the data set. This is gonna be a dictionary that has a image key and a mask key. So the image is gonna be a concatenated version. No, actually not concatenated version uh, of the before and after uh, images. So it's a tensor of shape two by three by 1024 by 1024. So uh, the first one here is the before image. The second one is the after image. And if you pass uh, one of these samples to uh, train data set plot or test data set dot plot, um, you should be able to uh, see uh, exactly what the before, after, and mask look like. Uh, this is really useful uh, for debugging and just getting a sense of what the data set looks like. Uh, I always like to just plot a lot of different examples uh, from the data set before I get into anything else. So you might do something like uh, for i in uh, numpy, dot random dot choice use this did we import that public So you might do something like this to show like 10 random samples from the training set. So 
Is everyone able to follow that? Is everyone able to see? Okay. Hopefully that was an easy, so we'll call that exercise two because exercise one was actually getting the data set. <laughs> Um, so now on to sort of the, the training code. Uh, where uh, Torch Studio uses PyTorch Lightning for uh, handling all of the uh, training, uh, training functionality. And the way PyTorch Lightning works is through uh, these classes called Lightning Modules uh, and then also Lightning Data Modules. So Lightning Modules handle all of uh, the uh, kind of the infrastructure around running some sort of training uh, operation on a model. Uh, and in Torch Geo, we have uh, pre-built lightning modules for different types of tasks that you might do with remotely sensed imagery, like classification, uh, segmentation. I think someone's working on object detection right now uh, and so on. Uh, and you uh, oftentimes will want to uh, extend one of the existing uh, uh, tasks that Torchio implements to kind of customize it to your needs. So in this cell, we've defined a custom semantic segmentation task that extends Torchio's semantic segmentation task that overrides uh, two of the kind of existing methods in uh, semantic segmentation tasks. Uh, and that's the training step in the validation step. And these are the methods that are called uh, each um, uh, during each iteration of the training loop. So when you're training a deep learning model, you, you want to iterate over your uh, training data, uh, call a forward pass through the model, compute the loss, um, and then uh, backpropagate that loss. Um, Lightning does that for you after you define whatever the loss is. And uh, the reason why we override this training step is to use a custom plotting code. So for the first 10 batches of each uh, epoch, we're going to uh, print out or display in TensorBoard uh, an example using uh, that same sort of plot function that we used up here to look at the different images. Um, and if you want to do more elaborate things like custom loss functions, uh, you can implement them there as well. Uh, and if you're curious uh, into kind of the details here, uh, it's definitely worth looking at uh, the semantic segmentation task code um, just in, in Torch Geo itself. So if you want to look at that, you can go to the GitHub um, just under Torch Geo uh, dot trainers dot segmentation, uh, and it's all it's all defined here. And you can see like the options you can define different types of segmentation models. For example, UNet, Deep Lab V3 Plus, uh, FCNs, uh, say what the encoders are, uh, and so on. You can already use different loss functions here. Um, that's get, getting kind of off the path. Uh, the important thing about this is that uh, it includes plotting for both training uh, and validation steps. Uh, the second step here is defining a Lightning data module. And uh, what Lightning data modules do is wrap all of the code that goes around defining uh, training, validation, and test splits and creating data loaders with those splits uh, into a single object uh, that you can just use in different training setups. Um, so here we've created a, a Levier CD plus data module, just extending a Lightning data module, uh, because Torchio doesn't already have a data module for this data set. Um, again, if we go back to the Torchio GitHub repo uh, and look at data modules, uh, here's a list of data modules that we already have implemented. Uh, similarly, you can go to, and maybe more easily, you could go to the documentation and look at the definitions of all the data modules here. Um, but I thought it would be more instructive uh, to show everyone how you might create uh, your own your own data module. So the key things to note here, and we're not going to do any implementation uh, of this data module because uh, I don't want to get 
too far into this. Uh, but the key steps are in this setup method where you're actually defining the data sets themselves. Uh, and then you need to define a train data loader, valve data loader, and test data loader in uh, those respective methods. And then the other thing to note is this uh, on batch, on after batch transfer method, uh, which is where we're going to do our um, augmentation steps. Uh, and this happens after each batch is moved to the GPU or whatever device that you're training on, this code will be run. And we use the uh, Cornea library to do augmentations. So you can see by default here, we have this set of augmentations that are applied randomly. Uh, so you have random rotation that's applied with um, 0.5 uh, probability up to 90 degrees, random horizontal flipping, random vertical flipping, random cropping to that patch size parameter that we defined up at the top uh, a couple of cells ago for all this nonsense, this patch size. Uh, so we set it to 256. So we'll be taking a 256 by 256 crop from our 1024 by 1024 inputs. Um, and then one of the uh, sort of tasks that we could uh, think about here is what else would we want to add to this uh, collection of augmentations to uh, improve regularization and potentially uh, test test time or validation time performance. So let me make sure I run these. Um, and feel free to stop me if you have any questions in any of these spots. Uh, so this cell is just instantiating that data module using the settings that we defined up above. So here's where patch size goes into it, um, the size of the validation uh, split in percentage, uh, and then things like batch size and number of data load workers are all responsibilities of your data module. Uh, next cell uh, is defining the uh, segmentation task. Um, and here we're all here's where all of the parameters for the torch geo uh, trader come into play. So if you look at the documentation under the semantic segmentation task, it gives a brief description of what uh, these different parameters mean. Um, so segmentation model, again, is the type of segmentation model architecture that you want to use. These are things like unit, unit plus plus, deep lab. Uh, each of these segmentation models, uh, these all come from the PyTorch segmentation models package, uh, just by the way. Um, they all let you define the architecture of the encoder. Uh, so these can be like a ResNet, VGG, uh, pretty much anything that you want, anything that the PyTorch image models or TIM library implements, you can use as an encoder. Uh, and then what set of weights do you want? And this is usually either ImageNet, pre-trained weights, or um, random initialization. Uh, in channels here is going to be six, yep, because our uh, inputs are these uh, six dimensional uh, tensors where we have just a concatenation of two three dimensional a before and an after image. So here we're implementing early fusion. We have two classes, a building change and a non building change class. Uh, you could model this as just a um, uh, binary task, but we, we use just cross entropy loss. Uh, this is where learning rate and learning rate schedule also come in. So these, these three things are part of PyTorch Lightning. Uh, so I don't necessarily have to talk more about them. This one writes out model checkpoints. Uh, this performs early stopping, obviously, and then this logs output to TensorBoard. So if you run that, uh, it's going to download the ResNet 18 pre-trained weights because we put ResNet 18 here. 
for example, if we set this to ResNet 50, um, it's going to download ResNet 50 weights. Uh, these should start a version of TensorBoard in Colab that we can watch while training is happening. Uh, but someone said that there was a problem with this earlier. Maybe it's the logs directory wasn't created. So it should be this like white screen for a little bit. It takes a while to load. Yep, should look like this. Um, so then finally, after we have that trainer object defined and the data module defined, you can uh, define this PyTorch Lightning uh, trainer, uh, which is a collection of all your callbacks, however you want to log, uh, and then you pass it like which GPU you want to use uh, and how many epochs you want to run for. Uh, and then you can simply call trainer.fit with your uh, task or lightning module and your data module. So if we run this, this should start the training process. Data set not found or corrupted. Uh, oh, okay. So back in this data module, uh, where we define the data module, we need to pass root equals data two instead of what it was because we moved where this was being downloaded. And then we run that. And pending more crazy bugs, uh, it should start training. So the first thing uh, PyTorch Lightning does is run a couple of validation steps to make sure your data loaders work as expected, um, which is nice. That catches some bugs, and then it'll go into the first epoch of training. Four oh three. Where are you seeing that? Hmm. That I have no idea. I'm actually not that familiar with using Colab. Uh, I just looked up how to run TensorBoard within a Colab notebook. Usually I just run TensorBoard in like a different console window and then open it up in a browser. Uh, but this isn't vital for this this tutorial so i guess what i'm saying is you can you can skip that uh at least for right now and then if you're implementing this in your own setup uh work through it then um so now that our model has trained for uh, over an epoch now, uh, you should be able to go if your if your TensorBoard is loaded uh, and press refresh uh, to get the data that we know of so far. Uh, if we change over to the uh, scalars tab, we should be able to see all the different things that that semantic segmentation task is automatically logging for us. Uh, so we can look at mean IOU um, over the training set, which right now is 0.1793. Uh, 
uh, we can look at the validation set, which is much higher at 0.41. Uh, look at things like validation loss. Uh, and these will, uh, if you have trained like, for like two epochs, these will update after you hit this refresh button. Uh, and then also, because we did that custom plotting code, um, we should be able to see examples of what our model is predicting over uh, the trade and the validation sets. So if I go to show actual image size, uh, this is one sample that it's currently looking at from training. You can see uh, the actual mask says that there's no change between these two, and our model is currently predicting this bunch of noise because we're early on in training. So it's always good to look at uh, the predictions that your model is making as well as a way to sanity check and debug what's actually going on. So if we go down here, look, we're on the second epoch now. This is a bit awkward because I'm in a small window. So yeah, if we update, our foul IRU improved a bit. Our trade IRU improved a bit more. Trade is now up at 0.42. So if we refresh again over here, we might have better looking outputs. Okay, so that's how uh, training works. So if you leave this running, uh, I think I trained for like 80 epochs or so in order to get um, this number, this F1 score. Uh, but if we, if we stop trading here, we can just press cancel. Um, and then we can do things like do trainer.test, where we're using now the test data loader to compute the uh, default metrics that the semantic segmentation task calculates for us, which are uh, overall accuracy and IOU, uh, mean IOU. So after that's finished, uh, we can also uh, just manually run the model over the entire test set to do things like compute uh, precision and recall uh, and F1 score, which is what the related work was reporting for, for this data set. And then this, uh, this code here is an example of how you would do that. So our test uh, mean IOU or Jacquard index here is 0.58, which isn't uh, great, but we also only trained for three box here. That's the power of uh, an image net initialization. I guess any questions while this runs, um, and then we can uh, do things like change the augmentations that we use um, or change the backbone or model type that we're using to see how that can potentially influence the results.
my session crashed. Uh, any any questions? Okay, so I, I guess the last thing is like you put it into the notebook where you create a custom geodata set. Yep. And then just generally that repo. I guess it's uh, worth noting um, this repo is a separate project that we're working here at uh, the AI for Good Lab. Uh, this is a uh, satellite imagery annotation tool um, that you can use to uh, get, uh, you, can, you can run annotation campaigns with it and you can use it just to uh, draw GeoJSON objects over different satellite imagery base maps. Uh, and what this notebook that I just posted does, uh, it's an example, training example, uh, IPython notebook, is it shows you how you can um, rasterize the GeoJSON labels to the bounds of your imagery, uh, and then create a uh, data module using the um, TorchGeo uh, raster data set objects to train a similar model. So the, the other assignments, the other things I had in mind here were going over how to change augmentations uh, and change, uh, change model background. Really cool, I'll be checking out the labeling tool to move it. Thank you. Um, so given what we've already gone over, um, my task for you all is to see if you can figure out how to change the augmentations that are used, maybe include uh, random resizing of the image patches. One of the related work notes that augmentation they use is they randomly resize each crop to um, from 50% size to 200% size during training. And I suspect that's going to give uh, some improvements in performance as it'll build in uh, sort of a resilience to different resolution inputs, but it's not currently included in the training pipeline that we're using. Uh, so figuring out how to use Cordia and what's currently in the notebook uh, can you implement that? Uh, and then also, can you change which model backbone is used? And maybe interesting thing here is to use the um, PyTorch image light, uh, library, Tim, to print out all the available backbones that you could use. Uh, let's see, PyTorch, not this. I'll post this link in the chat. So I will stick around for the next uh, 30 minutes or so 
if anyone has any questions on those tasks. Um, but I've gone over everything uh, that I had planned. So if there are no questions, uh, thank, thank you everyone so much for attending and for, for your attention. Uh, apologies again about that hiccup with the data downloading. Um, but yeah, I, again, I'll be around for the next 30 minutes or so if you do have questions. Um, Alexander Horn says, no questions specifically about the tutorial, uh, generally about what the next steps are for uh, <laughs> Torch Geo. Um, yeah, good question. So right now we're really working on improving the documentation. Um, we want to really expand this set of tutorials and the scope of the tutorials that we have uh, kind of over here on the left. Um, just to make it easier for people to discover what's possible, I assume that I'll be making a version of this notebook into actually an official tutorial. Um, and then we want to also focus a bit more on uh, pre-trained models and fleshing out how um, we can kind of publish a set of pre-trained model weights for a variety of different sensor platforms and band combinations. Uh, with benchmark results on how useful they are on downstream tasks like this data set. Um, another question, is it possible to use 10 pre-trained models in our example? Uh, yes, uh, and that's what I was uh, hinting at here with posting the link to Tim. Um, so if you if you import Tim, yeah, actually we can just step through it here. Uh, let's just do it here. And then list Tim dot list models. Um, so you can use any of these as the backbone uh, in your semantic segmentation task. And this is made possible by the segmentation models PyTorch library. Um, so if we look at the documentation here, uh, you have to add the TU prefix uh, in order to use them. So let's say we want to use wide resonant 50-2. Um, in the custom semantic segmentation task, we still keep the semantic or the segmentation model as a unit. Uh, and then for our encoder, we do TU dash wide resonant 50 dash two. Um, and it should be okay with that. Yep. And you can see that it's downloading these uh, pre trained models, uh, the pre trained weights for this particular model. Uh, and then after it's done with that, if we call uh, again, dot fit down here will be instead of training a unit with a resident 18 or a resident 50 backbone with this thing. And I think that's a really interesting uh, research direction, uh, actually. So in, in Toshio, we try to see uh, how just very basic approaches uh, perform on these data sets. And again, like how a basic unit with early fusion and a ResNet 18 or a ResNet 50 encoder performs on um, this change detection data set. Um, what I think would be really interesting is how good can we do with a basic setup with a state-of-the-art encoder, um, maybe a more elaborate um, segmentation model architecture, uh, looking at fusion in different stages. Um, that would be very small changes to the existing code base, uh, but potentially large differences in performance. And characterizing that over all the data sets in TorchGeo, I think would be give a really interesting range of performance.
a uh, question uh, about the data. Can we use the same command without the uh, bang symbol to download it locally? Uh, I guess depending on your environment, like if you scroll up. One second. Like if you just paste this or follow this link in your browser, uh, you should be able to get a copy, yeah, of the data set. Uh, but if you're on uh, like a Linux machine, then you should be able to use wget in order to get it as well. And if you wait like a day, uh, you should be able to use the Torch Geo auto download functionality to again get it from the Google Drive. When there are 70 something people trying to do it at once. Mm -hmm. On the topic of the the, the auto download, is uh, is your project looking into getting uh, corporate backing for more more long term download solutions? Or um, and I, I joke a little bit, obviously, because you work for Microsoft, but that was a little tongue in cheek. But you you go, I'm saying. Yeah. So none of the download links um, that we have currently are hosted on any. Uh, Microsoft resource, uh, except for this one, which I am going to delete after this uh, demonstration, um, because we don't want to have any any problems with like licensing uh, or anything like that. Um, one thing that we do is uh, if there isn't a public download link for a data set or the download is sort of convoluted, we encourage, we like write emails to authors and encourage them to host it on Zenodo um, so that they we can cite it. One, they can get credit for people who download it. Um, and then it's just more easily available. Um, so the link um, is zenodo.org. So if you do have a data set, highly recommend uh, hosting it on there. Um, and then you can get a link that is really easy to download and programmatically. Off the top of your head, do you have a, a percentage or a, of how many of the data sets are like of the community don't have it uh, freely available or easily available on Zenodo? Are we doing good or is it, it pretty rough? Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I know we've reached out to a couple of people. Uh, but like if someone has a Google Drive link or like a personal Dropbox link or something like that, um, hopefully we can convince them to move it to Zenodo so that it doesn't just go away uh, when they need more space in their Google Drive or Dropbox. Uh, but that, that's, well, that's one uh, issue that we should raise in the Torch Geo GitHub is that we should reach out to like all authors and all data sets to see if we can get everyone on Zenodo. That makes sense. Thank you. Yep. Oh, but actually to answer your question for like Microsoft backing, no, I don't think we should, even, even if it was an option, I don't think we should do that. I think it should be non-Microsoft. And why is that? Um, just because it's it doesn't it's doesn't make as much sense for me for Microsoft to host a copy of everything as like a public company when there are uh, resources like Zenodo who are dedicated to maintaining data sets and providing like DOIs for uh, data sets. And, I mean, Microsoft could also like support in order, right? Then, you know, give, give hosting resources, not necessarily um, officially supported by Microsoft, yep. but more like sponsored, right? Yep. That would be way over my head, but uh, I think that's, that's how it should work. It should be a, some, some, somebody like Zenodo should be responsible for that. But again, that's just my opinion.
Uh, it looks like another question. Uh, can we introduce our own model for the segmentation? Yes, um, that would require a little bit more work. Uh, let me show you. Um, so that would require defining your own um, uh, lightning module. So in our current uh, segmentation task, we're overriding a uh, semantic segmentation task, um, where in the semantic segmentation task, we're defining the model architecture. So if I go in, uh, let's see, Twitch Geo. Yeah, there are a couple extra steps that we'll need. Well, actually, if you just copy paste this whole thing. This is going to play about a lot of things. Uh, let's just do some things to make sure this works. Uh, okay, so in <clears throat> this code, uh, self dot model is the model architecture. So if you replace this with like a your custom model, then um, it, it should work no problem as long as you pay attention to respect whatever the number of channels that you're passing in whatever the number of classes outputted by your model is things like that but in general with pytorch lightning um the pl.trainer is going to take anything that's a valid lightning module Does that answer your question? I guess within uh, within the scope of uh, the Torch Geo trainers framework, not really. <laughs> if you want to define your entire uh, an entire custom PyTorch Lite module, then you can use it with any of the existing like uh, Torch Geo data modules or your own data module. Okay. 
but I'll, I'll paste the docs to the uh, PyTorch Lightning module because they give a much better overview of what one of those looks like. All right, if there are no more questions, well, let me ask this. Is there anyone that's still working through the notebook that might have questions? <laughs> I definitely can't keep you on. You, you are free to do whatever you'd like. 
Well, it seems like uh, everyone's working through the assignments and uh, we're almost nearing the end of the session. Um, so I would like to thank Dr. Robinson once again for the introductory lecture on change detection and the tutorial on Torchio for walking us through and troubleshooting along the way. And this can be such a great resource for uh, fast tracking change detection applications from uh, remote sensing imagery. And in the current context, there are so many uh, use cases for monitoring changes, disasters, recovery. And uh, I think we should stay tuned for any further updates to the package and look forward to your paper in six spatial. And I'd like to thank you once again for joining us, especially uh, the 5 a.m. time uh, across the time zones. And we appreciate that very much. No, um, no problem. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, and thank you to all the participants for joining us today for the first day. We hope these two sessions have been insightful for you. And please join us tomorrow at um, for session three uh, on zero and few shot learning. Yep. And if you would like to stay along, um, I think the link is going to be open for a while. So you can definitely do that and ask more questions if you have them. Yeah, I hope. Uh... Everyone has a, a great rest of the week. The schedule looks uh, amazing. I wish I had time to go through all the sessions myself. Uh, I'll post uh, my email in that um, Dropbox folder with, uh, on like a new file um, in case you want to reach out or have any other questions or uh, you can just open an issue on Torch Geo. That would be very helpful. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, everyone.